Well, thank you very much indeed. Welcome everyone. There's plenty of spare seats in the middle. If you feel like changing your view of the event, don't hesitate to come across and uh, join us. Thank you very much indeed for your engagement so far. This part of the meeting today is, is rather special because we've got some really experienced people to talk about connections. And it's with huge pleasure that I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Mortens Litkoft, who is the 70th President of the United States General Assembly and will be one of our principal discussants. Here he is. Now, just a couple of words. This man is a tireless activist. He's quite far out on the left, but at the same time, he works right in the middle of the system, and he's the most senior population in the United Nations. So please sit there, and now I'd like to introduce Diane Holdorf. Diane is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Kellogg's, and I've worked with her for years on agriculture, food systems, and now on climate issues. Diane, please sit there. And then thirdly, Jonathan Pershing, from physicist and geologist to chief negotiator for the United States of America in climate change talks. Jonathan, welcome. Please come and join us here up at the end. And what we're going to focus on is the synergy that comes from working together on climate change and the sustainable development goals. Just one minute on what actually happened last year from the point of view of somebody who's been working in this area for more than four decades. When nations came together in September last year and agreed the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, they were offering a political manifesto for the future of the world's people and the planet. Now just imagine it, a manifesto for the world by world leaders. And what that means is that all of us now have a very clear set of goals for which we must be working in all of our activities, together with 169 nice, clear targets, and more recently, many indicators to go with them. And within that set of goals, goal 13 is climate action. And with that political manifesto, we can now look at our children and our grandchildren and we can say, yes, there is a plan for the future of the world. There is a plan to restore the basic resources of our planet. There is a plan and the only plan to which we must all work. And we're going to talk about that plan here in the next 25 minutes. And I'm going to start by asking uh, President of the General Assembly, he'd like to tell us how the different elements, the climate agenda and the sustainable development goals come together, where does the money fit in, and how can we be sure that we get the right multi-stakeholder action to make a difference? Sir. Thank you very much, David. I, I, I think uh, we can never end underlining the fact that this is a very ambitious a revolutionary agenda for the future. And I don't think that all the leaders that signed in have actually realized how revolutionary this agenda is. And that's what we're going to push for. Uh, and uh, well, the question is, is often raised when I discuss these issues, uh, uh, what are the priorities? Which of the goals are, uh, are most uh, important? And that's a wrong question. Because we, uh, the, the point is, that if we don't move forward on all these goals at the same time, we'll probably reach none of them. Uh, that's the basic observation. But the other basic observation is, uh, if we don't move forward very urgently on climate, we will not get the resources or the possibilities to do the rest of it, to eradicate poverty in this globe. Because then we will create these enormous uh, uh, forced migration waves and co connected conflicts, and that will soak up that will swallow up all the resources we need to extinguish poverty and create education and so on. So th this connection is very, very important and underlining, of course, the, the urgency. How do we do it? We, uh, we uh, uh, have talked a lot about it already at this meeting also. We need 
national long-term planning, as Jeff Sachs just said. We need the framework that makes it obvious, the, frame, the regulatory framework, the taxation framework, that makes it obvious for each and every private company and private investor that the uh, sustainable investment is the most profitable investment. And we need the partnerships within this framework uh, between private and public sector that provide the resources, that make sure that we invest more, but also make sure that the investment we actually have will be the right one, will be the sustainable, will be the green one. And, uh, and I think that is a huge business community out there actually shouting for that kind of clarity from the political decision makers. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to tell all of you that actually our president of the General Assembly has been a real activist in his time this year. He had a big thematic debate in New York on April the 21st in which he invited stakeholders from business and from the investment community to come and focus on this. In one word, you're saying we need it. I'm now going to push you a bit further. Is it coming? Are you seeing evidence that the businesses and other actors are giving priority to this connected agenda? Well, I think I have two observations all the way from Addis to New York to Paris uh, during the last half of, of, of 2015, namely that uh, there is a this strong business community actually pushing. And there are a lot of developing countries who are already making plans and going into that useful competition which we, the United Nations, should encourage uh, uh, to meet the goals uh, and compare between each other uh, how, 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 how long have we uh, reached. I am a little more afraid of the so-called developed world. Uh, I mean, in, in Europe right now, uh, most of the discussion is concentrated around refugee problems and uh, the risk of Britain leaving the European Union. I don't see that much long-term planning in Europe uh, for this. And it is so extremely important that the, the most developed, the richest of countries, also jump into the transformation of their own, uh, their own energy systems and the, uh, the whole framework of, of how to produce and how to consume uh, and do it now. So, well, it's a very mixed picture right yeah. now. But when it comes to sustainable development, in your analysis, every country is a developing country. Yeah, the, the, that's, that's the, the, the very important thing. The, this is not the Millennium Development Goals about poor people and poor countries. This is yeah. about all countries and all people. Yeah. So Jonathan Pershing, thank you for joining us. You're newly appointed in this role as the chief of, uh, or the envoy for the United States. And we're really interested, I think, here today to hear, get your views and your feelings about the contribution of the United States to this interconnected agenda. So thank, <clears throat> thanks very much, David. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think that all of us are aware of the interconnectedness. I think everyone sitting at this room uh, has had a personal experience with how that works. Uh, you think about the development of your business community, and it's tied back into the economy. And that's in turn tied back into production, and that's tied back to your farming community, which Kellogg is clearly involved with, but it's tied back to opportunities globally. It's tied back into poverty and wages. It's tied back into the transport sector and the power sector and the food sector, you can't pull one strand without seeing the consequence to the whole. In that sense, I, I very much agree with the president uh, of, the, of the UN, at the moment there's no way to imagine a future scenario in which climate change is not managed. It affects everything. <clears throat> and if we think about the sustainable development goals, while the language of the goals only in a few instances has a particular reference to climate change, there probably isn't one in which it is not imperative and central. So let's look at some that are not obvious. I mean, the climate's obvious itself, right? That's one of the goals that's listed. Energy is pretty clear. We know exactly what that drives. But we don't necessarily think, for example, of women's issues as being one of the ones that we might really seek to elevate. And yet if we look at some of the successes around the technologies that are moving in many of the, the countries around the world, who's doing that work? It's women who are making the new entrepreneurial activities move forward. If we bring training and education to that community, they hold up half the sky and we think the sky is falling. So at the end of the day, it's a very interesting way to think about the solution. You have to manage that structure. 
And if you think about others on the health side, that doesn't mention climate change. No. Jeff talked a bit about this in his remarks about some of the shifts that we expect to see. But if you think about the disease vectors and how they're growing, and look in the United States as just an example of a developed country with this kind of risk, you see all of these problems. So my sense, personally, this is a critical endeavor. The linkage matters enormously. The fact that we've moved from the MDGs to the SDGs is a, an enormous and positive step forward. We have to maintain that vision of that interconnectedness as we manage this climate problem. And so thank you, Jonathan. As you were talking, I was thinking of the challenge that was given to us by Ban Ki-moon right at the beginning, uh, saying that we've got the political agreements, now it's the time to act, and the actions that you're describing, and I think everybody in this room can be part of, do relate to making the connections and getting those connections into every endeavor. And just in case any of you in the room think, uh-uh, this is just same old stuff, I can tell you from where I sit inside the United Nations, it is, as the President said, revolutionary. It changes the way in which people not only think, but the way they work and the way they engage with others. And that's why it's great to have Diane with us, because since I started working, actually, six or seven years ago on food and nutrition, it was, Diane was one of the earliest people that I joined up with on trying to find ways to link together business, civil society, farmers, and governments on uh, getting better food security. Diane, from your perspective, how can we enrich and deepen this multi-stakeholder working that you've championed? Thank you, David. You know, the Sustainable Development Goals are a remarkable call to action for business. We have so many economic models against which we can measure our performance and our success across all of these sectors, but the Sustainable Development Goals provide that framework for measuring our social impacts. And by its very nature, business has social impacts from where we source to where we operate to where we sell our products into. And we have to be able to use that as a force for good, not just for our own business, but to be able to also measure the sustainability of our own business models and those resources upon which we all depend, both human and natural. So we look to this the SDGs as a tremendous way of considering what is that role that we have to contribute to transformative change. And the momentum that was starting already with the announcement of the Sustainable Development Goals in September that really continued so powerfully through Paris and then into the events that we've seen this year, including just two weeks ago with the thematic debates and the signing ceremonies, the role of business and the voice of leadership and business saying, yes, we are willing to also step forward and make commitments. Kellogg was one of the companies in Paris who made approved science-based targets out to 2050, and we included our total supply base out to the farms, recognizing the importance of those issues. And we weren't alone in those types of commitments. Business is really seeing the opportunity to help voice leadership and change. But yet, what we hear a lot from, and rightfully so, by the way, is the energy sector, mm. the transportation sector, yeah. infrastructure. There's no question that these are critical business sectors to achieve both the speed and the transformation that we need to get to a low carbon economy. What Kellogg really tries to do through lending our voice is raise the lens on the fragility of our food systems. Yeah. Every single person depends on food every day, and we all care deeply about the food that we eat. And Kellogg cares about that as well. We look to these issues of food security, the growing population moving to nine billion people, and the intense pressure from climate change and population growth on natural resources, water, soil health, and we recognize that there's a tremendous challenge that we have to address. It's embodied within Sustainable Development Goal 2, food security and hunger and alleviating these issues. It's embodied within Sustainable Development Goal 5. Women make up 70% of the farm labor around the world, contributing particularly at smallholder farm levels. And of course, sustainable production. We all have a role in that. And 12.3 speaks specifically to food loss and waste reduction. And Champions 12.3 is a great example of how we can all lend voices to there. So there's no question that business has a leading role to play. It's not enough to just measure our performance against what we're doing today on these issues. We have to look at what we're going to actually drive to achieve significant goals and progress. Thank you, Diane. And so what I'm going to do now is to invite all three of the panelists in this, what unfortunately will be quite a short discussion, just to look ahead five years plus, what 
will success feel like and look like? And what will we have done through the various areas of influence that we have to contribute to that success? And the reason why I, would, I want to do that is I feel that much of what we have to do through these two days of meetings is to be looking ahead five years and setting the direction for all of us on where the transformation is going to take us. So, Mr. President, I know you, you won't be president of the General Assembly, and I won't ask you to tell me what you're going to do, <laughs> but I would be interested to know success from the perspective of the United Nations political membership. Well, the overarching uh, goal uh, in the SDGs uh, is that within the next 15 years, we have eradicated extreme poverty in this world. And that's, a, of course, a very, very central goal to have. But in order to make that reasonably realistic, we have to realize from now on that it's not the same path that brought us down to half in extreme poverty. Uh, it's a different path from the one we have followed in this world the past 15 years and the past 70 years. That we have all the knowledge and most of the tools to do it right. And that technology is developing so quickly, so probably within the next five years, we have nearly all the tools we need. So this is about, and it can't be said too often, this is about governments taking the courageous decisions. This is about politicians within the next five years at least thinking as much or more about the next generation than of the next general election. Uh -huh. Uh, and make the plans that goes beyond the next general election and try to convince people not to listen to what they just actually feel or not feel, but to convince people that this is a necessary existential exercise. The sustainable development is not a recipe just for the good life. It, it describes how it is possible, in spite of all the challenges, to reach a decent, harmonious survival of humanity. But uh, there are existential threats out there, and if we don't meet them now, we may not be able to meet them, even in five years' time. Wow. So, next generation, not next general election. I always think these sound bites are helpful, you know? And then, not just the good life, but the right life. Jonathan. So th <clears throat> thanks very much. I, I have a, perhaps a somewhat more immediate take on it uh, that ties back into the longer term. It seems to me that five years from now, we need to have set in motion all the pieces that the president was talking about. I, I think that the vision in the long term is where we aspire. What we get in the next five years is what we can deliver. And from that perspective, we should be having a set of metrics that let us examine what we've done. To me, in the sense of the climate change agreements, we've got commitments from all the parties will we have moved on those commitments? We've got commitments in terms of industry announced over the course of the last several years. Will industry have moved on those? Will the financial structure and the enabling environment to change the trend of investment be apparent? Will we be looking now at opportunities for new technology that move us forward in terms of reduced carbon future? Will those be in place? They won't yet have delivered the change that we want, but in five years, we should see concrete evidence that those are not only in place, but acting and acting effectively. So putting it there, making it count, and telling other people that it's happened. Very clear. Jonathan, don't know what you'll be doing in five years, but we'll meet up somehow and f check it out. Diane, please. So David, I think what we said, what, what gets measured gets done. And we need to have clear metrics, and we need to have been able to consolidate those globally across all of these different sectors, public, private, and civil society, to demonstrate what we're actually achieving. As a consumer-facing company, what I would also add to this discussion is that consumers around the world increasingly want to buy from companies who they know share their values. We talk a lot about millennials. They've come up here today. One of the ways we can measure success is by how well we've connected these issues with that generation of buyers who want to make decisions with companies and other players reflecting their own values. And as these become increasingly critical to them, the role that we play in meeting those needs and giving them those options will be another way of really critically measuring our success. So, ladies and gentlemen, Diane's point builds on what we heard 
from the others. So we are actually demonstrating, not just to everybody, but particularly to the younger generation, that the changes are happening in ways that reflect their values. And I suppose I could then add to, to, to these comments my own view that, frankly, what I hope is that in five years' time, young people, people under 20, 25, will start to forgive us. Because actually, we haven't done so well. It's taken us ages to realize the seriousness of the challenges facing our planet and its people. Look, people like me who've been working in development for more than 40 years, we've not done so well. And so I hope that in five years' time, by 2021, there'll be the beginnings of the forgiveness that we crave and that we will have been able to start to make the world the sustainable place that it needs to be, not just for our children, but for their children and their children's children. So thank you very much indeed for joining us for this short discussion. Please give a big hand to my guests. All these people here work tirelessly way, way, way harder than they should, and it's fabulous that they could spare the time to come here and join us. Enjoy the rest of the day, two days. Ladies and